the many others, you know, if we're gonna if we're gonna go to all the world with kingdom flag unfurled, we better have a bold and unwavering confidence in who our Lord is. Uh, I just when we consider all the shortcomings and shortfalls of of our faith and the sense of not going to all the world or the other things that we face. That's the most singular foundation that I, that I know of, that, that we don't have the confidence of who our God truly is. And I don't know of a better place to establish those truths in, in our lives. You know, we talked this morning about a low view of him. Uh, it means a toleration of sin. Uh, uh, you know, in Galatians, we're told that, that make no mistake, God is not mocked. Uh, and yet we, we, we talk in terms of those things. And, and all I can think of is the only possible way for that to continue forward is if we don't have a right view of our God. And in Genesis, I don't know that there's a more foundational place to establish the fullness of who he is. So if you would turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. And we are going to continue forward in our study of Genesis uh, as we come to the third day to exist ever upon this earth. Uh, There have been many... Uh, whether it was a, a Tuesday or a Wednesday or what day was actually the Sabbath, all that, lay that to the side. There have been many of those, whatever that third day was, since that original time. But this description is of the very first one. Uh, and there's some amazing aspects of, of what's going on uh, at that point. At this time in our study, uh, we've seen there have only been two previous days. And there's so much that has already been accomplished uh, and so each time, I think because we've had such breaks in between with communion and, and other things that, that I read, I want to begin again at verse 1 and just read all the way through to this third day with, with some a little commentary for reminder. Just take a few minutes and be reminded of what we've already seen in the Genesis account of our origins of creation. Beginning in verse 1, in the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. In this very first verse, we've seen that it's one of the most profound truths in all of Scripture. Uh, It lays the foundation for our existence, telling us the the how and the who of our creation, a a reality that that has plagued humanity and dumbfounded science for for generations. And and here it is summed up in, in one very simple sentence. In the beginning, God created both the heavens and the earth. And, and it's still a, a question plaguing us today, uh, understanding what is our origin? From where did we come and where are we going? And, and man is running to and fro trying to discover these things. And yet here, the very first sentence, it's laid out for us so beautifully. Now, recognizing that and the, the profound simplicity of it, also recognizing man's rebellion, uh, Please understand the opposition that must come because acceptance of this very first sentence would utterly devastate atheism. It would utterly devastate evolution, the rebellion against God, our creator. It would utterly devastate humanism. And these are all things that we hold near and dear in our generation and in our flesh. So, so this verse confronts and contradicts them soundly. And therefore, it must come under great scrutiny and disbelief by society at large. Continuing on into verse 2, he tells us that the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. We saw in our very first study these three great foundational truths that are, number one, our God is active in all aspects of his creation. He was creating, he was hovering, he was separating. That he was active in everything, he is not, as some posture today within the church, a cosmic watchmaker who basically wound it all up and then sits back and watches it go down the path that he hopes it ends up on. Number two, our God is able to create from nothing and bring forth everything. This dispels any ideas that somehow God's design was such that it required the evolutionary process to accomplish it. Number three, our God is a God of order and not of chaos. In all of this first day, he is establishing order and giving it a prescribed understanding for us to follow. And so on the first day ever, consider what happened. Time, matter, and space were spoken into existence by our God. That's on the first day. 
On the second day, we come to verse 6, it says that God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the heavens. God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse. And it was so. God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning a second day. And again, this is important. We saw that it continues to bolster our understanding of the character and nature of our God. Even as he is accomplishing our foundations at creation or the beginning, he is also displaying his foundation of who he is as well. The essence of who he is or what we are called by faith to believe and trust in all of our lives. Consider this, the foundational attributes of our God or his omnis, as we call them. His omnipotence, that he is all-powerful, speaking into existence from nothing, whatever he desires. His omnipresence, that he is all-present in all aspects of time, history, and presence. He has no beginning. He has no end. He is omniscient, seeing all things from the end and the beginning. He's all-knowing of all things that ever have been, ever will be, and ever are being. And he's also omnibenevolent. We see in his creative work that all that he does is perfectly good. These omnis, so to speak, or foundational attributes of our God, shape our views of him. More, more than that, if we have faith in these truths, this shapes all of our views of life. In other words, when we consider things like going to all the world with kingdom flag unfurled, you are not going to do that. Hear me on this. You are not going to do that if you don't have absolute and utter confidence in an omnipotent, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, omnibenevolent God who's calling you to do those things with his authority at the backdrop. That's, that's what our Lord says. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. And then at the end of that, he says what? And lo, I am with you always. To the end of that, this is our confidence for everything in our Christianity is based on the character of our God, the unchanging character that's being displayed in Genesis chapter one at that first, second, and third day ever. On that second day, he continues to prepare his creation for his purposes, which will find its culmination, so to speak, on day six. One of the reasons we review this is because there's much that is repetitive in each of these days. We see in each of these days the goodness of our God, his preparation, his provision, his, uh, that there is no chaos, his intentionality. These are repetitive themes in each of the days. And we see that in this, he, he is continuing to create or to prepare his creation for his purposes which find its culmination on day six. If you know the account, on day six, he creates man and woman in his image. In his image, he created them. We saw this morning, why did he create them? To glorify him, to sing his praises. The heavens display his praises. The firmament declare his majesty. The, the, the picture of all of his creation is, is pointing to his glory. And even as he gives us this amazing theater of creation, I, one of the fathers of our Reformation says that, that creation is man's theater upon which that stage he brings forth the glory of God to all who are watching. Have you ever thought about how God is preparing that in this account of creation? He gives us this amazing theater, providing for all of our needs and doing so with perfect preparation and provision, as the creation account tells us. On day two, he separated the water, which was covering the earth in, in half, basically, and still recognized this, even as he did that, it still covered the whole earth. Even as he took half of it, or, or whatever portion he took, dividing it, he says, there's still a covering over the entire earth, which he leaves. Now, he doesn't specify, and we talked about this when we studied the second day, he doesn't specify what he does with the one above. However, he does go into great detail with the one below. And so let's focus on that for our evening together as he describes it in the third day, beginning in verse 9. Then God said, Let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth. And the gathering of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. 
Then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with the seed in them after their kind. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning a third day. You know, this third day is, is the day of the most significant or large-scale change in all of the account of creation. Things are rapidly progressing on this third day, uh, and the details of God's plan continues to unfold before us. Water everywhere is suddenly replaced by a green paradise set upon dry ground. A fertile, mature, yielding of fruit and seed garden that comes forth. Consider that in verse 9 and 10. I want to begin by just looking at this, the, the, the miracle of dry land. The miracle of dry land. Then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the gathering of the waters he called seas and God saw that it was good. You know, I think sometimes we get to a place where we begin to take for granted certain elements of who our God is and what he's provided for us. But we talked about this in Matthew chapter 6, that, that we get to a place where we're so focused on what we don't have that we forget to be utterly thankful for all that we do have. And, and, and dry land, have you ever, I mean, honestly, here in Florida where the sea level is, is on average about, what, 15 feet above sea level, we should be eternally thankful for dry land. Uh, you know, my wife lives in somewhat a fear of tsunami, and, and rightfully so in this sense. If a tsunami uh, the size of what hit, hit Indonesia were to hit us, there would be no Florida. It would go from Fort Myers all the way across Stewart because there's nothing to stand in its way. It, we, we, dry land is really important. I, I've spent several days this week or two days this week on the ocean, and I enjoyed it greatly because I don't have to live on it. That's what made it enjoyable. And so it's important for us uh, to, to just be thankful, I think sometimes for the simple things. Uh, and we'll see that in Scripture, it's absolutely that picture. It's such an essential part of the account. It sets the stage again for God's culminating creation, His image bearer. We're, we're not made to live in the sea. We're made to live on dry ground, as are many other of His creation. And so He gave us that which was necessary. This action understand this is an unnatural one. I I don't understand the fullness of this, but I've read enough about it to to recognize it. Water should, in a sense, be covering all of the earth. Not rather gathered in heaps so as to give place for life and land. This is not a natural act. It is a miraculous act of our Creator. And I want to point that out to you and understand how Scripture gives Him praise for this simple truth, which I think we take for granted. Look with me uh, in just a moment. We're going to go to Psalm 33 as you're turning there. uh, Think about this. I've read several articles and I've heard this for years. Uh, I've heard that the anticipation is that water will someday cover Florida entirely. Uh, We've heard that. I've heard different time frames and other things, but as the polar ice cap melts and as the seas rise and as this happens and that happens, I don't know if you know this. Does anyone know what the highest land mass is in the state of Florida or anticipated to be in South Florida? The landfill in Okeechobee. That's going to be the highest land mass south of, I think, Tallahassee as far as sea level. The landfill in in Okeechobee, Florida, has often been scientifically postulated as a place that soon will no longer be here other than as a a big reef, so to speak. I've heard that for years. You know, they estimate scientifically that the majority of the Earth's water flows underground. Some of it's some 400 miles deep. That some of the aquifers and other things, that's mind-boggling. That's deeper than Florida is wide. It flows underground, and most scientists, almost all scientists, as a matter of fact, I've never read one that wasn't in agreement that the earth once was entirely covered in water, just as the creation account states. Even today, do you know what percentage of the earth's surface is actually above water? It's the minority, 29%. 71% of the earth's surface is in fact covered with water to this day. And with what's below the surface, make no mistake, there's more water, so to speak, than there is land surface. 
It is all aspects of our Lord's creation and His sustenance a miracle. It's one for which He deserves our praise. Listen to how the psalmist addresses it in Psalm 33, beginning in verse 7. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays the deeps in storehouses. Listen to what he says should happen because of that. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. In Jeremiah chapter 5, if you want to turn there, we're, we're going to bounce around a little bit and just look at some of the passages where we see God's people giving him praise for his creation. And yet I, I think that, again, we, we come to a place where we oftentimes take that so for granted. In Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 22, the Lord speaking addresses the people and says, Do you not fear me? declares the Lord, do you not tremble in my presence? And listen to, he says, he says, this is one of the reasons why you should have this view of awe, reverence, and even fear of who I am. For I have placed the sand as a boundary for the sea, an eternal decree, so it cannot cross over it. Though the waves toss, yet they cannot prevail. Though they roar, yet they cannot cross over it. God says very clearly to his people that his creative work, very specifically at times, to his gathering of the waters into the heaps or, or into the singular or into the locations where they are kept, is a reason for us to stand in awe of him, is a reason for us to, to worship him in fear and trembling. And we take it for granted, do we not? When I consider some of the things that are going on within this nation alone, within Christianity, so to speak, or the church at large here in our country, or, or, or just even within the church period, where sin is scoffed at, where it's taken as something so lightly, and yet here our Lord says, do you not know whom you are dealing with? If you don't understand, read Genesis 1, where I spoke into existence everything that is that you might stand and fear and awe of who I am. Turn with me to Job 38. Job 38. We're going to spend a little bit of time there. Uh, it's just one of my favorite sections in all of Scripture. Uh, I can't help but go there every time I think of the, the, the awe and reverence that our God and His creative aspects deserves from us. In Job 38, he specifically, in one section, beginning in verse 8, we're going we're gonna to come back to Job 38 more entirely a little bit later, but, but just listen to how he addresses Job. You know this section where he calls Job to stand before him. He's going to question him from the whirlwind, and he wants Job to answer him like a man. And, and in verse 8, he, he begins with addressing this aspect of his creative work that we're in on the third day. He says in verse 8, Who enclosed the sea with doors? When bursting forth, it went out from the womb. When I made a cloud its garment, and thick darkness its swaddling band, and I placed boundaries on it, and set a bolt indoors, and I said, Thus far you shall come, but no farther, and here shall your proud waves stop. Brothers and sisters, we are not swimming tonight because God has placed boundaries upon the waters, and he alone maintains them. Not only did he create them, he sustains them. Colossians 1, verses 16 and 17, we're told this about our, our Savior. And I remember back in the interim season, just in the, the uncertainty and struggle of a church that was hurting, going to this, this section in Colossians most influenced my decision to teach through Colossians to the body, to just help us to understand together that Jesus Christ is both supreme and sufficient for all things. Listen to verse 16 and 17 of chapter 1. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. It is by the sustaining work of our Lord Jesus that the oceans still maintain their boundaries. Again, we are not swimming today because of Christ. 
So in one sense, our very existence is precipitated upon our God's creation, yes, but also upon the, the, the goodness of the divisions and the boundaries that he has placed over his creation. On a side note, the plural word seas tells us that even as they gathered into one place, that simply means that they were separated from land and held in their place. Not that there was one singular body of water. Now to be clear though, in all of this, there is some mystery, and we'll see this more fully tonight, but we also know this, that later in Genesis, we're going to come to a singular catastrophic event that rearranged the face of creation. As we see it in Genesis 1, it is transformed a little bit further in Genesis 6 through 8. We know that as the flood. And so in all of this study, keep that in your mind. Be reminded continually of the flood that comes later, as this is such the clear explainer of almost all of modern science's questions regarding the landscape distinctions observable today that are different from the account of creation we have in Genesis 1. Now, going forward, what else do we see on this third day? We also see his hand of provision. His hand of provision. And this is an important truth for us. Again, the boldness. When we talk about in Matthew 6, our Lord says, be, don't, don't be worried about the needs that you have. Look from the beginning of time how our Lord himself is making provision for all that is necessary. Verses 11 and 12 of Genesis 1. It says this. We saw the dry land. Now we see the vegetation. Then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plant yielding seed and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind. And God saw that it was good. And so here, here's this picture. Vegetation, plants, and trees. All things being created and brought forth with a specific kind and may, being created to provide or to continue to provide after that. It's very intentional. Very intentional that God was making provision for the creation that he was creating. It's intentional in design with the needs of his creation, both clearly recognized, but more than that, clearly provided for. Clearly provided for. Again, when we think of Matthew 6, where we have just finished such a, a lengthy study of, of recognizing what our Lord says when he says, do not be concerned about the needs of this life, what you will eat or what you will drink, for do you not see how I provide for that which I have created, even the sparrows and the, the, the grass of the field, how it's clothed the way it is? Here's the picture about not worrying because of our Father's provision. You see, our Heavenly Father's provision for His creation is detailed in creation in such a way to build our confidence and destroy our worry over the needs we have. Our God who spoke and it obeyed and came into existence fully mature with specific purpose and provision, that same God is still on His throne. That same God is still ruling over your needs this week. That same God who is on this third day doing such amazing, powerful, miraculous things is an unchanging God who still today is doing just as he desires and pleases with his omnibenevolence, his omnipotence, his omniscience, all of these things firmly rooted and in place. There's nothing for us to worry about. Provision is promised and proven. The second thing, though, is there is a supernatural element. So much of Christianity today, it seems like it can't get the pendulum right. It either swings way over here in mysticism, and it's all about the supernatural. It's all about, well, we want to see this, and we want to have signs and wonders, and, and we want to experience this, and we want to do that, and it's all mystical and, and supernatural and, and, and truly not what we have in Scripture. Or it kind of kind of swings over here where, where we have this idea that, you know what, there's just this dry dustiness uh, to our God, and, and we don't recognize the fullness our God is supernatural. I'll give you an example of probably the greatest example that exists when he saves a sinner. When he regenerates and takes a corrupt heart of stone and replaces it with a heart of flesh, there is not a greater miracle in all of history. 
And he is doing that on a regular basis. We in this church have experienced him do that three times in the recent weeks and months. To see how our Lord does that is, is the greatest miraculous act ever. And, and know this, he is doing that work. There is an utter supernatural element to our God. Think about this and what it proves for us. Look at the order. We know scientifically that the plants need the sun and moon for a variety of reasons to grow and survive, including the seasons they bring. We recognize that science can observe that. But God doesn't need them to cause his work to be accomplished and to flourish. What did he create first? The plants. He hadn't even yet brought the large body of light and the smaller body of light. We're going to see that in the future. Before that even came to be, God said, no, this is how I'm going to do it. And he did. Utterly supernatural. He spoke it into mature creation. We talked about this the last time when we were saying about carbon dating and other things. Even if there's a measure of accuracy, the account in creation skews the whole thing. Because imagine this. Imagine if a medical doctor were to meet Adam when he was one day old. And the medical doctor were to take dimensions and, and take the scope of his, of his size and the, the fullness of his teeth structure and all the other things that a medical professional would know. He would never say, this person, this human is one day old. Because God created Adam mature in the same way he created the trees, in the same way he created everything. So whatever measure of measurement that would be taken for understanding scientifically, creation does not take any of that into account. It was created mature. Now, an interesting note, I, I was looking through Scripture. When God does something miraculous, outside, outside the scope of the natural seasons that he has put in place, he often explains it. Not always in the moment, not always exactly how, because I don't know that we can comprehend the supernatural. I mean, to comprehend God speaking in, in a tree, you know, I, I don't think we have that capacity. But he does tell us that he himself has done it. Example, the flood. He tells us who caused the flood. He makes no bones about it. He, he doesn't say, well, there was an earthquake and this is what happened. He says, I did that. When he parted the sea for Moses and the Israelite children to go across on dry ground. I don't, maybe he used a great wind. I, maybe he did a multitude of things. I don't know exactly how he did it. I just know that he says he did it. The resurrection. How did God defeat death by going into the bowels of death to poison it from the inside? I don't know. But I know that he did. He told us so. Even consider the trials that Job faced. He never received an explanation as far as we know, but we're told in the pages of Scripture that God himself was in that accomplishing those things. And more than that, we're blessed to be those who have a completed canon of Scripture. What does that mean? That means that we know the future conclusion. We know the end. And that's an important aspect. Even as we're studying the beginning, I'm struck continually how important it is for us as believers to have the confidence that we also know the end. That our God has given it to us, even to the degree of the warning signs or birth pains as our Lord describes them of preparation. Now, to be clear, I love science. I've said that. And I want to prove that because a lot of people don't believe that when I say it because I'm continually railing against the, the foolishness and the rebellion of what is called science today. I love science in its truest form because it is a means to discovering more about our God and his creation. It truly, when it's practiced in the way that, that it's intended or the true form of science, it is revealing so much that gives us greater understanding of our God and his character and the miraculous work that he did in provision and creation for us. When science is rebellious against God's word, it ceases to be science. It ceases to be accurate. It ceases to be true. It should never be a contradiction to God or his word. However, on the same note, let us not forget, if, if you held your finger in Job 38, go back to that. We're limited, okay? We are finite. He is infinite. 
He, he tells us that no man can understand his ways because they're not our ways. It doesn't align itself in every way. There are elements, again, remembering the supernatural element of our Lord that defies. Just think of the term supernatural. It takes that which is natural and exceeds it. Supernatural. We must never forget that there is mystery to our God and the power and in the fullness and the character of who he is. In Deuteronomy 29, 29, you would be well, you would do well to memorize this verse. Uh, he tells us clearly that the revealed things belong to us, but the, the mysteries belong to our God. And so he gives us certain things that we can handle, but he doesn't give us everything. And I love that. I, I love that. I, I don't know that it would be something that I could give my life to the worship and pursuit and passion of a singular purpose of glorifying a God that I could fully understand. Because if he fits in my pea brain, he probably isn't God. If I can contain him in my finite logical reasoning and understanding, is he really God? So consider this when he confronts Job. And listen to, I'm just going to highlight just a few, because uh, it goes on and on for, for a couple chapters. The mystery of creation as it pertains to man's knowledge. And even more than that, his guesses. Think about this. Overlap it with what we've heard from evolution. The Big Bang, that we all came from, from a single organism, that, that, that all of these things that we've postulated or guessed or hypothesized about. Consider what God says to Job. Look at verse 4. He says, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Where, where were you? Verse 5 who set its measurements? Since you know. Do you see what he's saying to Job? He's saying, you're speaking out of your ignorance. Do you not know who you're speaking of? I am the one who did it. And I've been so gracious to give you a small glimpse of understanding, which you cannot fully understand. And now you're going to begin to think that you somehow have gained reasonable understanding? That you can somehow look at these things and say, we have exceeded what God has given us? He goes on and he says, just listen continually, verse, verse 12. Have you ever in your life commanded the morning and caused the dawn to know its place? Going down, verse 16. Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you even understood the expanse of the earth? Tell me if you know all of this. And that just continues into this chapter and into the next chapter. And what he's saying is this. Think about this. This reminds me of the evolutionist standing before the whirlwind and postulating his theories, his hypotheses, and his arrogant assumptions upon our creator there is no natural explanation for creation and they're beginning to realize that you know it's amazing when you read as i've said to you many times it's hard to nail down even what evolution stands for because it's continually evolving Every theory that existed in, in, in the 70s is now changed in the 80s, and that's been debunked, and now in the 90s they've come up with new ones, and, and it's almost a continual element. And they say, well, that's how you know that it's real, because we're, we're not nailed down, we're still growing in it. No, you keep changing it to fit what you've proven to be a failure. There is no natural explanation for creation. Thus God has explained it for us. He knows that we can't discover these things. He's told us this is how. This is what happened. Anything else is a pagan, rebellious mindset. A pagan, rebellious mindset. Science claims that it dispels such pagan philosophies. I, it claims that, that, that it stands and, and takes the, 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 the poor, ignorant uh, native in their country who's been worshiping the sun and brings enlightenment to them and other things. And, and yet time and time again, it proves that it's become one itself it's become a pagan philosophy in other words when we study ancient religions what do we see them doing continually asking their deities to provide fertility in the seasons and performing many rituals and other things to bring this about listen to professor alan ross give an example this is an interesting example 
about how this day three stands in bold contrast to the pagan religions in, in view uh, of their deities. He says, This decree for fertility stands in bold relief to the ancient mythologies. In Canaan, for example, the religious myth claimed that Baal could produce fertility. At the end of the year, Baal died, an idea that explained why the crops died, and was said to be captured by a god whose name was Death, and carried away to the abyss, the domain of Prince C. Now this is all recorded historical truth. But in the spring, the goddess Anat, Baal's consort, rescued him in a bloody battle, defeating Prince C in the process. The reappearance of Baal thus ensured that the crops would grow in the new year and accounted for the change of seasons in the spring. Most of the ancient religions had such rituals designed to induce the gods to produce crops and fruit and life as well. In contrast to corrupt accounts of fertility, the text of Genesis simply but powerfully reports that God gathered the seas together and decreed that the fertile earth produce vegetation. Fertility is a self-perpetuating process de decreed by God. A created capacity from the true Lord of life. Listen to this. There is no God sea, just the seas that God controls. Vegetation does not result from some pagan god's springtime ascendancy through depraved ritual. It results from the majestic word of the sovereign Lord of creation. And I listen to that and I think, okay, I understand that's pagan ritual and that's all of this mindless this and that and they come up with that and everything else. But then I look at evolution and it's the same thing. Well, we're not sure, but we think maybe monkeys played a part. Well, maybe it was crystals. Now they're saying aliens. And it's just this continual process of trying to come to any answer that allows them to continue in rebellion against God. Interesting note in this section, when it says, let the earth sprout and it brought forth, many of those who postulated a theistic evolution use this passage to say, well, that, that's where the Lord, he just kind of triggered it, but then we see him using evolution forward. This is not an allowance for evolutionary processes, as the creation of vegetation follows along with all other elements of creation, and that it was created by his words, mature. Did you see that in the, in the section? It was already containing the necessary seed. It didn't, over time, develop to maturity and begin to then somehow reproduce. It was instantaneous. Also, it's interesting, I don't know if you realize this, but because science recognizes that the earth at one time was covered by water, they believe, therefore, that everything began from a marine state. That all vegetation and other things came from marine life. Well, here we have the order. By God's own word, the order of vegetation prior. We're going to see the seas teeming with life in the days ahead. Here on day three, vegetation is brought forth prior to marine life, and it denies the evolutionary hypothesis that all life evolved from marine life at its beginning. Now, obviously, the evolutionists would say, well, we don't believe in the creation account. However, what we have to understand is that the theistic evolutionists who would try and merge the two now has to account with the fact that by his scientific arrival, he is now in denial of the clarity of what God's Word says. There's no way to merge the two. Number three, it's an interesting note. We're told that everything is creating or reproducing after its kind. After its kind. This is a destroyer of both evolution and theistic evolution. In other words, created things, what we experience, what's observable around us, does not reproduce new kinds over time. We know that. And the evolutionist knows that it's never been observed. He has to hypothesize and postulate. They do not repro reproduce new kinds, but rather they reproduce after their own kind. This is a creation truth which is stated repeatedly in our account in Genesis. The Hebrew word for, this, for kind is the word mean. M-I-N is, is the best way, but it's pronounced mean. is used 31 times in the Old Testament. It's 30 times by Moses. Once by Ezekiel. 
31 times this word is used. There's a summary. Dr. MacArthur gives a summary of what Dr. Morris spends multiple more pages on. And I want you to hear the summary in what he says. He says, this word is generally equivalent to the English word species. The fact that creatures reproduce according to their own kind is a fundamental rule of genetics. Each organism has a unique DNA structure with genes and chromosomes that determine all of its characteristics. Careful breeding can emphasize or minimize certain characteristics within genotypes, but no amount of cross-pollination can cause a whole new life form to arise from the species that already exist. It's a scientific impossibility. And this, I love this. The more science, true scientific knowledge that we get about how we're made, understanding our DNA structure and, and chromosomes and everything that we've advanced in true science is continually pointing to the creation account and holding up a greater degree of awe and reverence for our God who gave us that. It's denying everything that we're observing through true science is denying the hypotheses of false science and evolution. Let me give you an example from an article that I was reading. And this is not a, it's not a, a Christian magazine. It says this, There are approximately 60 different species of oak trees native to the United States. The oaks found in North America fall into one of only two groups, white oaks and red oaks. And that is all within the own kind picture we see described in Scripture. Understand, here, here's what I mean by that. Oaks can produce other oaks. We even can see cross-pollination within oaks where you then get different subspecies out of these oaks. This is all true, and we scientifically recognize that. But nothing can go outside of its own kind or species. In other words, you're not going to see any, any oak oranges. It won't happen. You can see different fruit trees cross-pollinating and producing different varieties of fruit within their own kind, but you will not see an oak tree someday sprouting oranges. It's not possible. And to go even further, there are certainly no oak tadpoles swimming around. There's no oak cubs being born. I love this. The fact that true science, as we practice it, is continually revealing that which is in contradiction, not to Scripture, but in contradiction to the false science of evolution. Interestingly, we see this throughout the pages of Scripture. We see it in the observable world around us. All of His creation obeys His eternal decrees except for us. We're it. The sun and the moon are in His orbit as he spoke and sustains them to be. The seas are still in their boundaries, as he has commanded them to be. Their proud waves stop at the doors he's placed. The plants and vegetation are producing after their kind, as he commanded them to do. And yet man, even contained by his creation design. You see, we can't reproduce into something else either. But we buck against this continually. Let us, let us not... Here's the warning for us. Let us not buy into and promote rebellion against him. But rather, let this account of creation do the work in our hearts that God himself designed and desired for it to do. He gave it to us for a reason. He didn't just write Genesis 1 to create controversy. He gave it to us, his children, for a reason and purpose. Let me remind you of what that is in the verses we read earlier. Psalm 33 Verses 7 through 9. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. Genesis 1 is meant to bring us to a point of rightful recognition of who He is that we might both fear Him and stand in awe of Him. Jeremiah, as he confronts and rebukes his people, he says, do you not fear me? Do you not fear me, declares the Lord. Do you not tremble in my presence? Think about this. We all face temptation. We all face struggles. We all face the reality of the brokenness of this world and the contamination of our flesh. We all face what we've inherited from Adam. Even as God has redeemed us, we still face the realities of sin. 
How does a young man keep his ways pure? By the word of God. Thy word have I hidden my heart that I might not sin against you. I, I would tell you this. There's an element where, where the account of creation is such a significant picture of our God that holding this high and rightly before us will guard us from sin. Why? Because if you're understanding his omnis that are being displayed, then even when you're alone and you think no one else is watching, you know he is. Even when you think that it's not that big of a deal because the person next to you is doing worse, you know that's not his standard. It's the protection over us for what he's called us to be and do. Jeremiah 5, 22, do you not fear me? Do you not fear me? This is him speaking to his people. Do you not fear me, declares the Lord. Do you not tremble in my presence? It's hard for me to remember the last time that, that, I, that I've experienced someone trembling in the presence of the Lord. It happens. But it's become rarer and rarer. We should not be that. Here's why. For I have placed the sand as a boundary for the sea, an eternal degree, so it cannot cross over it. Though the waves toss it, they cannot prevail. Though they roar, yet they cannot cross over. Because of this do you not fear me, declares the Lord. This is such a beautiful picture of who we are intended to be. There's a passage in the Psalms that says that the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. I think it's in Psalm 19. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. This, this is the work that this is to be doing in our lives. And then, of course, we have our familiar conclusion in verse 13. There was evening and there was morning, a third day. Again, let me, let me read Dr. Morris. He summarizes this so well. And this is repetitive. Our Lord says this every day of creation. So listen to what he says. Uh, this is him summarizing the terms evening, which comes from the Hebrew word ereb, and morning, which comes from the Hebrew word boger, each occur, occur more than 100 times in the Old Testament. And they always, every single occurrence, have the literal meaning that is, the termination of the daily period of light and the daily period of darkness, respectively. Similarly, the occurrence of day modified by a numeral. Example, third day. Is a construction occurring more than 100 times in the Pentateuch alone, always with a literal 24-hour meaning. Even though it may challenge, and hear this, even though it may challenge our minds to visualize the lands and the seas and all plants being formed in one literal day, that is exactly what the Bible says. He finishes with this. We are not justified at all in questioning either God's power to do this or his veracity in telling us that he did this. Brothers and sisters, let us not be those who speak from our ignorance about God as Job did. But rather, let us be those who are humble and contrite and who tremble at his word. What we have in the Genesis account is not only truth by the faith which we claim, but I would say it is also the only plausible account for the true scientific observations that we have made rather than the rebellious hypothesis that we have speculated upon in our generation. Genesis is again on this third day detailing to a greater degree of knowledge the foundational character of our Heavenly Father for our confidence and for our rest upon his sure promises and provision and that our worship might reflect the fullness of who he is. Let us be those who recognize what he has given us. Would you pray with me this evening? Lord, we are eternally grateful for our salvation, Lord, which through the giving of your spirit, we have the illumination of scripture, which you have inspired and preserved for us. And because of that, we can look upon our, our beginnings, our origins, and we can see your handiwork. It should drive us to a place of greater worship. It should drive us to a place of greater holiness. Lord, you have given all of these things as the guardrails and guidelines which contain us and keep us persevering after you, lighting our paths and enlightening our, 
our, our ways, Lord, in such a way that we can worship you in fullness of grace and truth. Lord, I pray for us as the church body, I pray that we would take these truths, that we would hold them dear to our hearts, that we would be emboldened by them, that we would recognize what they encapsulate for us as it pertains to your character. And that coming forth from even tonight, that we would have a higher regard for you. Lord, that we would have a high view of you in all that we do, as your account of creation certainly should be giving us. Lord, we give you the praise as we ask for your strength in these things. And in your son Christ's name we ask. Amen.